The word the Lord has me giving today is related to the book in a way. And it's called Aligned, Armored, and Advancing. Because that's really where we are as people in the body of Christ. We have to be aligned, we must be armored, and we must be on an advance. If we're just sitting and being stagnant, we're not being who God created us to be, and we're not accomplishing what he left us in the earth to accomplish. If he didn't have something for us on the earth to do, when we accepted Christ, he could just take us home. But that's not the reason he came anyway. He didn't come to take us to heaven. He came to use us to bring heaven to earth. Religion says it's all about us getting to heaven. But Jesus, did, Jesus, and I've said this a number of times lately, he didn't come preaching the gospel of salvation. He didn't come to bring a new religion. He came to bring a kingdom. He came to bring rule and reign. He came to bring his authority in the earth to restore from Genesis 1 what God did at the very beginning. He created male and female in his, li in his likeness, in his image. He created them, right? And he said to them what? Go and have dominion. Rule over. Now, that doesn't mean we rule with an iron fist. It doesn't mean we rule in the way that the world rules. We rule by the ways of heaven. But most of us have not been taught that in growing up. And I'm just going to tell you, I am pre-reading Greg Hood's new book on the kingdom. Get ready. It is awesome. Um, it is so, so good. And just clear teaching on the kingdom of God. So it, I think it's supposed to be released the end of the month, and it'll be a part of Kingdom U for next year. So just get ready because it's a good one. Um, and it's just got me fueled up on us understanding the kingdom. I prayed for years, God, what, what is this thing about the kingdom? Because I was raised thinking church. I wasn't raised thinking kingdom. And the more he unpacked it, the more I was like, oh, my goodness, we've, so, we've missed so much. So God's calling us to be aligned, to be armored, and to advance. So what is it to be aligned? And I'm going to make a few statements, and I'm going to look at Scripture and just walk through this. It's not going to be, I don't think it'll be very long, but the army on the earth is aligning with the armies in heaven, the angelic host. See, we've got to be aligned with heaven. The angels are always doing the bidding of Holy Spirit, right? They're always doing the bidding of the com commander of the Lord's host. Those who haven't done what he said got booted. Right? Is that not what happened to Lucifer and a third of the angels? They didn't align with the commander. They're no longer there. The rest of the angelic host, they are perfectly aligned with the commander. God is looking for us to be likewise aligned with the commander. Ephesians 4, 8 through 16 in the Passion Translation says, And he has generously given each one of us supernatural grace according to the size of the gift of Christ. How big is the gift of Christ? Can you even... We can't even comprehend. We have no words. This is why it says, He ascends into the heavenly heights, taken his many captured ones with him, and gifts were given to men. He ascended means that he returned to heaven after he had first descended from the heights of heaven even to the lower region, namely the earth. The same one who descended is also the one who ascended above the heights of heaven in order to... To begin the restoration and fulfillment of all things. That's very important that you see that phrase. In order. Why did he come? Why did he die? Why was he buried? Why did he, was he raised again? Why did he ascend? It's so that he could begin the restoration and fulfillment of all things. 
And he has appointed some with grace to be apostles and some with grace to be prophets and some with grace to be evangelists and some with grace to be pastors and some with grace to be teachers. And their calling is to nurture and prepare, to equip and to align all the holy believers to do their own works of ministry. And as they do this, they will enlarge and build up the body of Christ. See, it's about every single one of you doing the works of ministry God's called you to. That's, a, that's a, not a new thought in here, but that's a new thought for much of the body of Christ. Because it's looking for the ministers to do all the work. No, 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 you're the ministers. That's who you are when you're in the body of Christ. And then, listen, uh, when... Verse 13, these grace ministries will function until we attain oneness into the faith, until we all experience the fullness of what it means to know the Son of God. And finally, we become one into a perfect man with the full dimensions of spiritual maturity and fully developed into the abundance of Christ. That sounds good, doesn't it? And then our immaturity will end. And we will not be easily shaken by trouble, nor led astray by novel teachings or by the false doctrines of deceivers who teach clever lies. But instead, we will remain strong and always sincere in our love as we express the truth. All our direction and ministries will flow from Christ and lead us deeper into him the anointed head of his body, the church. For his body has been formed in his image and is closely joined together and constantly connected as one. And every member, say every member, has been given divine gifts to contribute to the growth of all. And as these gifts operate effectively throughout the whole body, we are built up and made perfect or mature in love. See, we're never going to come into the maturity of love. We're never going to come into that fullness of who God created us to be until every member is operating in their gifting. Until everyone is releasing their ministry gift. It takes all of us. So God is saying that we have to be armed individually in truth, in righteousness, in peace, in faith, in salvation, taking up the spirit of God. I jumped over a page. How's that for having two sides of a page and jumping to the wrong one? Hey, we're all, we have no regrets today, right? Because there's grace in the room. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Love it. Um, it's the one way to keep speakers humble. You know, it's all good. <laughs> but I want us to take a look at this thing about alignment for another minute. And we talked about the angel armies. But last week we talked about Jacob wrestling, right? If you back up in Genesis 32, and at the end, Jacob is wrestling with the Lord until his own strength is removed and he walks with a limp. But in the beginning of that chapter in Genesis 32, 1 and 2, it says, Now as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him. Jacob said when he saw them, this is God's camp. So he named that place Mahanaim. And Mahanaim means two camps or two armies. So what two camps and what two armies? The camp in heaven and the camp on the earth. The army in heaven and the army on the earth. And guess what? God had to wrestle with Jacob to get him to a place so that the army on the earth would be aligned with the army in heaven. See, God's working on us. He's touching and bringing us to the place of Jabbok where we're emptied. 
so that we can come into a place of aligning with heaven. And when heaven and earth align, there is an advancement that begins to happen in the earth that all of hell cannot stand against. But we have to be aligned with heaven. We have to be aligned with the heart of the Father. We have to be aligned with the will and the purpose of God. We can't be going on our own way. We can't choose what, which way we're going. We figured that out yet. I mean, he gives us the choice. But what happens when we choose our own way? It's not real good. I mean, the blessings are not there. But for us to enter into the land of God's promise, just like Jacob returned to the land of his fathers, to the land of promise, God wants us to return to the land of promise, to the land of his presence. See, God wants us to so live in the garden of his presence. Walking with him, listening and talking with him, hearing him move in the rustling of the winds. Hear him moving as we're walking along in our day-to-day -day living and hearing, being so sensitized to his voice and his movement that we move with him. And we can we are his, the sheep of his pasture, and his sheep hear his voice, so we can all hear his voice. So he wants us to align from earth to heaven. We're not asking heaven to align with us. God is pulling us into a line with him. And then he wants us to be aligned together. It's both a horizontal and a vertical alignment. We have to be aligned with Christ, but then we have to be aligned with each other. Now, I've used this analogy with us before, but what happens if you have a joint that's out of joint? Have you had a, you know, a shoulder out of whack? Mm, got one. Or you've had a broken bone? Nothing else really works right. I mean, it can be one part of your body, but it throws the entire body out. See, that's why we've got to each be supplying what we bring. We've got to be in place. See, alignment isn't just about you being able to operate. It's about you being properly positioned and postured to be and do what God called you to do. When we are positioned and postured properly, then life flows from the head throughout the entire body. And those that you are connected to, those that you are aligned with, supply strength to you. Therefore, you become stronger. The very gift that God has in you increases when you're properly connected. There is a grace gift that flows when you're connected. You get to move into greater measures. One of the things that in alignment, when we're, even when we're thinking about, like as a house, we're aligned with Dutch Sheets and with Chuck Pierce. That alignment releases a grace into this house that we're able to tap into things that they've warred for that we haven't warred for. We, we gather, we glean, we, that supplies into us a greater increase of revelation, a greater increase of authority, so that it enables us to keep moving in new ways. When you're out of alignment, you cut yourself off from that supply. I have watched over the years as different ones have become aligned with, say, with Chuck or Dutch or even with us. Those who give themselves into the alignment, who really bring their portion and say, I want to receive and I want to give. It's not just about receiving. It's receiving and giving. When they really do that, they prosper and multiply in their gifting, in their calling, in their sphere of authority. Those that do it in name only or in word only, only get that measure of a benefit. And then eventually they fall away. So it's important that we understand that alignment really is saying, God, I'm, 
I'm going to position myself where you tell me to be positioned. I'm going to lock in. I remember years ago I was feeling out of joint where I was. And I said, Lord, I just feel like I am like it's out of sync. And he said, do you want me to give you the divine fit for this assignment? And I said, yeah, because this being out of joint thing is not any fun. And I literally heard, like, how many of you have had chiropractor crack your neck? I know some like it, some don't. And you hear that. I heard that. And from that point forward, things went smoother. So ask God to give you that divine fit. And then you have to really work it. You know, when you get a chiropractor a jump, they can put it back, but you have to work the muscles around it so it stays in place. Otherwise, you'll go back out again. And that's where we often miss it is that we don't exercise being connected so that the life flow can go and will move properly. So God's calling us to align as his body, as his temple, as the army of the Lord, positioned for every joint to supply what is needed. So we're aligned. And then God calls us to be armored. The army on the earth, the faithful ecclesia, is armored, fully armored individually and corporately in the fullness of Christ and his leadership in truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation to advance together using the power of the sword of the Spirit in declarations and decrees in the unity of the Spirit with great power to defeat the enemy. Does that sound good? See, a lot of things that we've tried to defeat individually have been a corporate principality that we need to defeat corporately. We've been trying to fight. How many of you have heard people go to top of mountains to try to take down Jezebel? Did it do any good? There are certain things that are government structure. Jezebel operates a governmental structure under the rule of Baal, which is Satan, okay? And they operate like a kingdom because they are. They are a government. And they operate like a government. What does it take to overthrow a government? A stronger government. An individual is not going to take down a government. It takes a government to take down a government. I'm talking spiritual. I'm not talking don't anybody here or over the line think, and I'm thinking political. I'm not. It has nothing to do with that. I'm talking about ruling powers that are holding people captive. Holding people captive. Entire regions held captive by a governmental structure in the spirit realm that is blinding people. It's holding them in captivity. You know, Jesus said in Luke 4 that he had been, was anointed to what? Set captives free, right? That the blind would see, and that's not always physical blindness. There are a lot of people right now that are under a spiritual principality's influence that are blinded. They're in bondage. And they, they can't see because of the blinding. 2 Corinthians 4 says if they, and 5 talks about if they're blinded by the God of this age, right? If they hear your gospel but they can't hear it, it's because they've been blinded by the God of this age. We have got to come into a place of a corporate armored anointing to deal with the principalities and powers that are blinding the people of a region so that they can hear truth. So that they can hear the gospel of the kingdom. And so a lot of times in the past, we've been trying to do this individually rather than having a corporately aligned expression of the ecclesia. And so God's calling us in this place. But let's look at the armor for a minute. And y'all, if you buy the book, if you read the book, not just buy the book, but if you read the book, how many of you buy books and they sit on a shelf? Well, 
This one needs to be read. I'm just going to tell you. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God. It's God's armor. Remember that. So that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Can you just agree with me that they're manifesting and we're seeing them pretty blatantly right now? They're, they're bold. And they're in our face. And God's allowing it. Because we've been blinded for too long. Verse 13. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that. I like these so that words. There's a reason. So that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit and with this in view. Be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. See, we need to be armored individually. Every, you know, you just, and don't do this, I got to get up every morning and put the armor on. Don't take it off. <laughs> I mean, how many of you get attacks in the night? Keep your armor on. You can take off your suit and your clothes to get into the bed, but leave your armor on, please. But we need to be armored individually in truth, in righteousness, in peace, in faith, in salvation, taking up the sword of the Spirit in all prayer. In truth, living and speaking in truth, in love, without compromise or hesitancy. Truth, not as the world describes it or defines it, but truth as it's defined by the Spirit of truth and the Word of truth. See, we've got to return to truth. Living, secondly, in righteousness. Right standing before God and right living before God and man. From the inside out. Righteousness is not religious legalism. It is living according to the word and the grace of God. See, Religion will put righteousness on you as a straitjacket. That if you do anything that you enjoy doing, it's got to be sin. (laughs) Right? God wants us to enjoy Him and enjoy life. I mean, where did we get that from? And where does religion come from? The pit of darkness. It did not originate in the heart of the Father. I was going to say. Okay. Then we have to walk in peace. And that word peace, we've heard me say this over and over again over the last almost two years now, is the word Irene, E-I-R-E-N-E. And one of the meanings is to walk in national tranquility. In the midst of chaos. We need to be walking in peace. That's the kind of peace. But that peace doesn't come from the outside. That peace comes from the inside. Walk in peace that surpasses all understanding. Knowing that the God who created you is the God who rules and reigns. 
and in is in you, say he's in me, to empower me to be and do all he created me for. And see, when we're, our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, we can go forth and tread on serpents and scorpions and every e evil thing, and it will by no means harm us. We can go because our feet are shod with peace. We're being led by truth, walking in righteousness, moving in the peace of God, that everywhere we go, the sole of our feet trods, God will give it to us. But if you're not walking in peace, he can't. It is the God of peace who crushes Satan under your feet, according to Romans. See, when you're out of peace, you may go war, but you're warring from a wrong posture. A lot of times right now we have people warring not, out, not from a posture of peace or a standing in peace and confidence. We're warring out of frustration, anger, etc vindictiveness come on now that doesn't mean that when you war from a place of peace you're always being nice peace can be pretty strong because it's not about peacekeeping it's about peacemaking there are some things you can't keep peace with we can't keep peace with evil we can't keep peace with some of the evil agendas that are operating in our court system and in our school systems and everything other system. We can't keep peace in that, but we walk in peace to make peace. That means we don't get ruffled and flustered by everything that's going on. We, we get to a place where we're still here from heaven and move in obedience. And wait. Sometimes we just have to wait a while. Then we live and operate in faith, knowing that without faith it is impossible to please God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. So we have to learn to listen for what the Spirit of God is saying. And with a determination to obey. When you begin to look at the Hebraic mindset of listening... Their word for listen always means that they listened with an intention to obey. A lot of times we listen, but then we say, I'm going to think about that to see if I'll obey it or not. I want to figure out if I believe that's God. We read the Bible that way at times. God's saying, no, you need to listen to me with an intention and a determination to obey me. When we have the word of the Lord and it comes, we begin to pray that word. We meditate on it until we come into a union with that word. Because a lot of times when we get the word of the Lord, it comes and we go, what? I mean, over a year ago, actually it's close to two years ago, Greg Hood stood in this place and he began to prophesy. He saw angels pushing this wall out to enlarge our space. And I said, Lord, really? <laughs> I mean, I really did. Because, you know, expansion's a, a deal. I don't care what you're expanding, it's always a deal. And then all of a sudden, but I didn't reject the word. I just said, okay, God, you're going to help me come into faith for that one. And I prayed it, I meditated on it, I waited upon the Lord with it. I believe, I said, God, I believe you. I don't know how, but I believe you. Let it be done unto us according to your will. And then we get the call, and here we go. That wall isn't literally, but it is because they're coming this way. And it's interesting, he saw the, pe the angels on the other side of the wall pushing this way. See, the things you don't comprehend when you first hear a word that makes sense later. So it was expanding us by them coming in here. But we had to, I had to come to faith on that. We've had to come to faith on it. But we need to be armored in faith so that it, things are that we're hoping for become substance in us. That's faith. 
Then we walk in peace. I put walking in peace twice in there. I tell you what, I'm all kinds of messed up today, aren't I? Oh, well. Um, we lift up the faith, and then we take on the living and the salvation with the mind of Christ. We have to have the mind of Christ guiding our thoughts. So we have to change the way we think. If you've been listening to Dutch any recently on the Give Him 15, a lot of the posts have been about change the way you think. Repentance isn't confession. Repentance is changing the way we think because the way we think will change the way we live. It all starts in the way we think. When we're in the corporate armor, so that was individual, we are aligned as the body, the temple, the army, then we choose to come into an alignment with Christ's leadership grace gifts. Those whom he has graced to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, shepherds, and teachers. See, not all of us are graced with one of those gifts. But when we choose to align with God's fivefold leadership gifts, what those gifts carry get activated to move through the entire body. So apostolic grace begins to flow through the entire body. Prophetic revelation begins to flow in a new way. An evangelistic passion begins to bubble up from the inside. The, the righteousness of the, of the prophet operates. The evangelist begins to move. Okay? You see how this works? Faith begins. The shepherd. We begin to care for each other. We begin to put that shield of faith around people that are around us just by relationship. See, sometimes you're going to be around people that are walking through dark valleys. You can be that voice of the good shepherd to them. And when you're aligned, it gets activated in you in a new way. Coming into the mind of Christ with the helmet of salvation that teaching gift. You have an anointing within you that teaches you all things. That does not mean, as I've heard some say, well, I've got the anointing. I don't need a teacher. That is not what that verse says. When you have an anointing within you, which you do by the power of Holy Spirit, then when a teacher comes, then the anointing within you activates and grabs hold of what is being taught, so then it becomes yours. You don't, it's not an isolation from, it's a receiving from gets activated and it matures in you. Does that make sense? So we need these five-fold gifts armored around us in fullness where they're activated so that we can advance. So the last word is advancing. We are aligned and armored together as we are. We advance quickly and mightily in victory against all the schemes of the enemy. Philippians 3, 12 through 16 in the Passion Translation says, I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing, but I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me to make me his own. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. Isn't it amazing how the Spirit of God led us earlier in the service to deal with regrets and letting go? Nobody knew what I was preaching today, but God did. Move us beyond the past. Let go of the past. Verse 14, I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. 
So let all who are fully mature have this same passion. And if anyone is not yet gripped by these desires, God will reveal it to them. And let us all advance together to reach this victory prize following one path with one passion. Isn't that awesome? One path. We're not scattered. We're not running helter-skelter. We may be doing different things because we all have different assignments. I look around the room, and we've got different assignments all over the city and even into the nation doing different things that we're gifted, called, trained, equipped, and positioned for. But the deal is we're doing different things, but we're going toward one purpose to see Christ's kingdom brought and established on earth. And see, if we're... If we're running helter-skelter without that as our focus, we're really not accomplishing what God called us to. We're just running after something. We may be running after the American dream. We may be running after self-aggrandizement. We may be running after wanting things our own way. We may be running after our own prosperity. We may be running after our own comfort, our own safety. We may be running after our own whatever. But when we see Christ's kingdom is the passion for which we run, seeing Christ glorified is the passion for which we run, we can be in a lot of different places doing different things, but it all works together for good. It all works together to advance and lead us toward the victory prize. So what is the victory prize? It's not heaven. It's Christ, and it's Christ manifesting on earth. Now, will we go to heaven? Yeah, I'm grateful. Um, the homegoing service for um, Amy Miller was yesterday. It was hard. It's not what we expected. But it's put a fire in everyone who knew her. To advance the kingdom and to see souls saved and God's purposes established on the earth. Not to take us out and cause depression and defeat and what's the point to rise. No, it's put a fire in to keep going. See, we can't waste our sorrows. We can't waste the defeats because we all have them. And there are things like we, we've talked earlier that we don't understand. But God says, you don't have to understand everything. You have to trust me. And that will take us through a lot. There's a lot we don't understand. Richard and Kathy, we don't understand what y'all are walking through. But we trust God. And Ryder's going to be okay. Ryder's going to be okay. In fact, I want to share this with you. This is, I'm jumping off for a second. Y'all bear with me. It was into the midst of the debauchery of Eli's house that Eli, that Hannah gave Samuel to be raised. And he became a prophet and none of his words fell to the ground. So even in a place that doesn't look ideal, God can do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond what you ever dreamed. Hold on. God's not limited by what the devil's doing. He's not limited by what the devil is doing. And we're going to stand and believe Writers coming all the way through into his destiny. One of those great grandchildren aligned for the kingdom of God. See, our victory prize is Matthew 6 10. This is the prayer of Jesus as he was teaching his disciples Manifest your kingdom realm. And cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on earth, just as it is in heaven. 
That is the victory prize. Don't make this so ethereal you can't begin to dream what his kingdom realm manifesting in your life looks like. In your life, in your family, in your business, in the ministry, in your community, in the city, in the state, in the nation. What does it look like? But see, if we can't imagine what it looks like for us individually to have the kingdom realm of God manifesting, how can we dream for a nation? Begin dreaming. What would it look like for God's kingdom to really manifest in you? The limitations that the world has put on you don't exist when God's kingdom realm comes. The things that you were told you can't do, couldn't do, shouldn't do, they don't exist in the kingdom realm. What you go, well, I couldn't learn when I was a kid, guess what? <laughs> You're not limited in the kingdom realm because the Spirit of God dwells in you to teach you all things that you need to know. You're not limited. See, we, we tend to go into this whole thing of we're limited by our upbringing, we're limited by this, we're limited by that. I mean, we could go through a list. And if I started asking you to call out what are the limitations of your, have been the limitations of your life, we could fill up a couple of boards. Right? But when God's kingdom realm, when Holy Spirit comes and he begins to open up the vista for you to dream with him and dream his dream for your life and the kingdom realm comes and you begin to see it, what you see you can have. See, it makes no sense whatsoever that I should be doing this. All kinds of limitations. Number one, I'm a woman. Should never be doing this, right? That's what religion tells me. But God said, no, 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 don't let that limit you. Dream with me. Allow God to dream through you. To see what the kingdom realm coming would look like. What would the kingdom realm look like? Renee, what would the kingdom realm look like in your new business? What would it look like? And see, don't think religion. Think bringing kingdom rule. Think bringing the nature of the kingdom into whatever you're doing. The righteousness, truth, mercy. Goodness, kindness, justice, peace. What does that look like? What does it look like for where you live, for kingdom realm, character, authority, and nature of Christ to be manifested? And you don't have to be religious to do it. Just operate in who he is. Matthew 16, 18 through 19, the Passion Translation. We all know this passage. But I give you the name Peter, a stone. And this rock will be the bedrock foundation on which I build my church, my legislative assembly. And the power of death will not be able to overpower it. I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm. To forbid on earth that which is forbidden in heaven and to release on earth that which is released in heaven. God has given us the keys of the kingdom. Christ came not just as a redeemer to redeem you from your sin, but to redeem you into the kingdom. We are redeemed not just out of bondage, but we are redeemed into a kingdom to do what he has called us to do on the earth. See, we've got to learn how to see kingdom. 
When we're born again, it's so that we might see kingdom. That's what it says to Nicodemus, that you might see the kingdom. We'll unpack this more in the weeks to come because I really, I sense we've got to get this in a new way. See, the gospel of Christ and his kingdom came to restore. Remember the passage we read? It said it was restoring and fulfilling all things. To restore on earth everything that Adam and Eve lost. See, when they rebelled against God's order in the Garden of Eden, they lost it. But they didn't just lose a sweet place to live. They lost their purpose. They lost their destiny. But God already had a plan so that we could get it back. See, through Christ, we become ambassadors. What are ambassadors? Representatives of what? A kingdom, a government. See, we've got to begin to see ourselves as ambassadors. What do ambassadors do? They do the bidding of the king. They don't do their own bidding. They do the bidding of the king. See, we're supposed to be about doing the bidding of the king so that we might bring his kingdom on earth, getting the rule of heaven into the earth. Does that mean taking governmental places and turning a theocracy? No. See, we've got to quit thinking naturally. We've got to start thinking by the spirit. See, we advance by bringing the character, nature, and authority of Christ and the righteous rule and order of heaven into every arena of life. Every arena. Invite him to come in. So that then through us we can disciple nations. Nations isn't just boundaries like the United States. Nations is people groups, and I'm not just talk, talking ethnic groups, but people groups within different industries. Teachers, that's a people group. You have unique culture. Business people, that's a unique culture. Even different businesses within business culture, they're unique. Law, government, service industries, it all has a unique culture. And we are to bring the character, nature, rule, and authority of Christ into that by our very presence, by the way we operate, by our prayers, by our decrees, by when there's a problem facing you, you don't know how to answer. You go, God, I don't have a clue, but I know you know. And then, you know, you go in and you go, I have this thought. What about? What about trying this? You don't have to tell them God said. I mean, come on. Just go in with the truth. Go in with the creative idea God gave you. And watch things shift. And what that will do is you give them God's solutions that brings about what they were looking for. Then you're going to gain in favor. That's how advancement happens. But just ask. Don't make a big deal out of it. Ask. Eventually, they'll ask you. How did you know that? Then you can tell them because then you have an opportunity to give testimony of the goodness of God. See, we've got to learn to operate with the wisdom of God. See, we're to disciple nations Matthew 28, 19, and 20, I close with this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, I was trained that that was all about souls. Mark 16 is about souls. Matthew 28 is about nations. It's about people groups. It's about ethnos. It's about culture. It's about discipling culture to operate 
in the kingdom of God, whether they know it or not. Because when the kingdom of God is permeating a society, peace will abound. People will be more open to receiving the gospel individually. Their eyes won't be as blinded because the ruling power over a region will not be blinding them. Do you see how this works? See, we come at it from both sides. We go after souls, but we go after discipling nations as well. It's two-pronged. God is brilliant. He doesn't just go one way. He says, come at it from both sides. So God is aligning us, armoring us, so that we can advance to see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Would you stand? Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you have not left us alone, that you've given us your son and you've given us Holy Spirit. But Lord, you also haven't left us alone in that you've given us each other. And Lord, I thank you for the wonder and the mystery of the body of Christ. I thank you for the blessing of this assembly. And Lord, I pray that as we come into greater alignment, greater understanding and the reality of being armored together, that we will advance your kingdom in an ever-increasing measure so that your glory would be revealed throughout all of the sphere of authority and influence and assignment that you have given us. Lord, let your kingdom come to us and through us for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. If you signed up to serve, if you would go ahead and go to the kitchen, and then we will all meander that way. Not well, meander to the. We're going to eat. We're walking through the kitchen. We're not going to have the food in the family hall. And buy your books. Bring them in there. Uh, we are going to exercise what Apostle Jackie just said of our relationship with one another. So sit with somebody you don't know. There's lots of stories and lots of journeys that we can share amongst each other. So go and be blessed, and we will see you in the family hall.